Uh, my name is Rebecca Hanlon, and I am a professor at the uh, uh, DSI uh, NRF uh, Newton Fund Trilateral Research Chair in Transformative Innovation, uh, the 4IR and uh, Sustainable Development. And I have the pleasure today to uh, moderate uh, this masterclass. Um, this masterclass has been organized by uh, Transformative Innovation Policy South Africa, TIP SA. Uh, TIP SA is a collaborative um, network uh, that is um, managed by the, uh, the Department for Science and Innovation here in South Africa, the Center for uh, Science, Technology and Innovation Indicators, SESTI, at the Human Sciences Research Council, HSRC, and, uh, and the trilateral chair uh, that I, I and others uh, in the room are, are part of. Um, TIP SA uh, provides an opportunity to think differently about innovation and um, the policy solutions that are required for innovation to be transformative. Um, it works with a range of stakeholders and is cre creating a community of practice to broaden and deepen knowledge on a new way of thinking about innovation uh, and innovation policy. Um, one way in which we have been doing this is to, um, is to deepen knowledge in this area uh, through a range of uh, different, providing a range of different knowledge uh, resources, uh, one of which is uh, the masterclass sessions. We've had masterclass sessions on uh, key concepts in the area of transformative innovation policy, uh, the last two were on uh, social technical systems, uh, socio technical systems, and um, on uh, deep transitions. Today, uh, we will be having a masterclass uh, by uh, Chuck Daniels uh, on uh, policy capabilities. Uh, Dr. Chuck Daniels is a visiting member of the Trilateral Research Chair uh, here at, um, at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, he's also a research fellow in science, technology and innovation policy at the Science Policy Research Unit at SPRU at the University of Sussex. And he's also director of the Transformative Innovation Policy Africa Hub, which is part of the global uh, network of, uh, of scholars and practitioners working in the area of transformative innovation policy, known as the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium. Chucks is going to introduce you to uh, to the uh, the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, or TIPSI as it's known, uh, a little bit more. Um, Chucks is coming to us with a uh, a range of policy uh, experience and expertise. He has uh, provided support to various UN organisations, to uh, to governments uh, across Africa. He's currently. Uh, providing support to Uganda in reviewing its SDI policy um, and has done similar things uh, to a number of other uh, with another uh, a number of other countries uh, in in Africa. Um, so I want to, without further ado, hand over to Chucks uh, and invite him to talk to us uh, about uh, policy capabilities in transformative innovation policy. Uh, Chucks will will talk for uh, just uh, an, around 45 minutes, and then we'll have a, uh, a, a question and answer session. For those of you who are online, please feel free to write your qu comments and questions in the chat, and we'll collect them up. Uh, for those of you who are joining uh, us in person, uh, we'll have a, a round of, of comments and questions from the floor afterwards. So thank you for today. Thank you for joining us from everywhere you are. So we'll we won't do much of introduction anymore. Thanks for the host for inviting us. This is part of a series of master classes that have taken place before. So we'll be we'll be unpacking capabilities a little bit, but not from the traditional sense of looking at capabilities broadly from the theoretical work, and that's a massive area of work. We spent a few years of that of my life of that working on that. So we will not go back into the full that. What we're going to do instead is to try to look at the topic from what we do at TIPSI, which is the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, our work and the, the way our work informs the capabilities that we use. So we'll be taking that perspective. So apologies for the ones who were expecting the massive theoretical framework. We won't do that. There is a, there's a lot of that. So, so this is the title. We'll try to talk about 
why we do capabilities the way we do them, why what informs our approach, and then how we do them, and then what capabilities we have been building in the process of doing what we do. So, so it's more from our actual research approach, which looks takes care of many of the theories. So it's informed by heavy theory for sure. So don't worry about that. However, we don't to do it from there, we do it from the practice of the work of providing interdisciplinary research. So, but before the why and the how and the what, we'll just give a brief, just a quick, a, a quick background on, on, on what TIPS is. Most people will know that already, so apologies if you're in the group who don't know that. So, the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to achieve? So, we'll come to that. So, we'll unpack that a little bit. We'll start with that. And then we'll go again, like I discussed now, just to explain. Discuss the why we do the tip capabilities, the way we do them, how, why, what informs the approach. And then we we'll look at the how, the approach. And then we we'll go into the capabilities we'll build. Without providing a comprehensive list, we we'll, we'll show the category of capabilities that we've been developing in the process. Of the work through our hubs. So, what is TIPC? This is a, is a global consortium of member countries, which forms about 12 of us. The number keeps changing, so by next day we'll be updated. But this is one of the most up to date uh, image we have. So, we we'll look at the, con con the countries together. We have associate members, we'll discuss a little bit about them. The UK is one of them with Science Policy Research Unit, where we are based. But we also have South Africa as a founding member. We have Sweden, we have we have Colombia, Finland, Norway, and then, and then a few countries. We have countries who are not full members, they are associates, associate members. You can see that below China, Senegal, Kenya, Panama is one of them, is on the blue side. Uh, let me see if the point that works. Oh, okay. So you have a point. Okay, so here these are the associates, associate countries. This is like China, Senegal, Kenya, Ghana, and then we have the countries within the African Hall. But here you have the UK, you have South Africa, Sweden, Colombia, Finland, and Norway. So these are the group of countries who come together. Why are we together? That we can see in the next slide. So what are these countries trying to do? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? Tipsy has a few points, but we can summarize them into these three main, into these three main uh, points around. First of all, the, the way the science, technology, and innovation policy direction has moved over the while, we, we recently we keep noticing gaps. So what we've been trying to do is to redirect the narrative, but also redirect the action, the policy on science, technology, and innovation towards SDGs, transformation, we we'll look at that. But then in this perspective, we we'll look at addressing economic growth alongside social and environmental priorities. So uh, as opposed to the exist to the previous approach which was very heavy on economic growth and, and paying less attention on social and environmental challenges. This is a way to look at the three components of the SDG. So these countries have come together is a is a is a partnership coalition of the willing. These are interested members who have joined together to do this. And then we also you, if we want to do this, if we want to achieve the objective one, then we need a way to do that. So we build demonstrators, we do experiments, we do some work. So this is around the approach. So we want to develop a team, a, a group of people, some actors, some people who can actually demonstrate how to do this. So we have a methodology. Yeah, so we're here. So the, and the next part is to generate a network of people and organizations, which we have. We'll talk about that a bit more. So community of practice, people in terms of individuals, but also organizations who work on this area. So just one more slide, I think, on this one. So how do we, what is our full year program? So this activity started around 2016, 2017, but the core program, which we've been running since 2018, is this summarizing. If you look at it, you see within Within there, we have we have evaluation and learning. So there is a lot of deep learning. We we'll focus on learning, and you see why we do that. Um, it's a research program, so there's a lot of research and knowledge co-production and co-creation, which we we'll come back to. Then we see policy experimentation, policy experiments with demonstrators, and then we we'll come back to training and capacity building. Within this core, we also have other things we do: country-specific work. We have a communication group that has been very helpful in designing some of these materials you see here. But that is for, so for today, we'll be focusing on this aspect, which is the training and capacity building. What we do on this, 
Uh, in order to do this, we'll be discussing some of the work we do on the three, on evaluation, but also knowledge and research production. We'll discuss that. And then as we do those other three areas, what capacity are we building in the process? So this brings us to why do we build the capabilities, the type of capabilities that we build? Why? How do we do that? We, we all agree that the world needs to move towards the SDG. So this is one of our conceptualization of the SDGs, the way we look at it. If you look on, on the left, there is this, uh, you see here where we look at the systems, the things that happens as systems involve social and technical system, the way we compact it. This is a work by, by our colleagues. And then you see what we refer to as framework condition. But the idea here beyond, before the SDGs, the way we approached, the way the STI policy has focused on has not been exactly what the SDG is requiring us to do. So the SDG is a response to some of the local challenges we have, but also the, the need for transformation. So we talked about addressing the SDG and also transformation. So this is one of the reasons we build it, with the argument being for us to actually achieve the SDG. There is a lot of uh, transformation, but that needs to happen. And the kind of change we need often is not the level of the incremental changes that has been going on or that we need. So this will require some radical changes. So this is one of the reasons and one of the drivers. So, but in a nutshell, the work of TIPSI focuses on this, focuses on addressing the SDG, which in our own way involves economic, social, but also environmental, the three dimensions of the SDG and environmental challenges. So that's one of the reasons, quickly, I'm trying to be as fast as we can on this first part so we can go into the detail. Uh, this has been mentioned a bit, but the, in our framing, the first frame is where innovation policy has focused on research and development a lot and regulation, but that lets was very good, it's still useful now. However, there are some gaps that has emerged from that, which led to more of the focus on what we refer to frame two, the NSI, the National Systems of Innovation, which is still useful and also dominant today. However, with the frame one and frame two happening, there are still challenges that are not yet addressed. We still see environmental problems rising, we see a lot of social degradation rising. So, so what is happening within the frame three, which is where we locate our work mostly, our work also covers this and that, but locating the work here a lot means the transformation we're looking will be happening here. Now, this is not TIPSI only doing this, it's all for that part now, so it's globally working on this, and which is why we say it's also emerging because it's still, the thinking is still ongoing, so it hasn't been fully finalized. So we won't go into this because there has been some sessions that I've talked around today, but we look at the frame three, an important thing as well to note here is that three frames coexist. So we also do R&D, we do research, we also focus on regulation, but then a lot of our work still uses from two thinking, the NSI, the systems thinking. However, there is need to move towards the frame three approach. Now, what is the frame three approach? Is, is a bigger discussion and we've had uh, some master classes on that. But in a way to look at that briefly, one of the way to look at it is to look at the points that frame three tried to, to focus on. Issues of directionality, uh, societal goals, a uh, system level impact, impact that is broader, you know, not just uh, at sectoral levels, at system level, learning and reflexibility, which we we'll mentioned a bit more, and then how do we deal with conflict and consensus within the innovation process? And then lastly, inclusivity. We won't talk about this more. This again just links to links to the last one, but the some of them will repeat later. But the directionality, for example, is very important and is a major discussion and a major area of research now. I think there's one more slide just to say on why we do what we're doing. Okay, so issues of this is showing that many of these points have not been addressed effectively in the frame one and frame two approach. So, which is why we're also going to us to them. So. Uh, maybe one more point on why we do this. There is also the, this is just to show, there has been a lot of discussion and we still know now that there's a policy implementation that remains a major area of complaint across the world. We have many policies but we can implement them. Our implementation is very weak or it's very low or it's very slow or it doesn't happen to the level we want. So how do we in experimentation, in demonstration, in our approach, improve the process of policy making? policy processes, policy implementation, policy governance, policy 
policy evaluation, and so we do a lot of work on evaluation as well. The, the traditional thinking normally is you go from step one to step two to step three, which is again this linear approach. Like we go from step one agenda setting to this, that this is from the this is from UNECA, this is from the UK. So showing how the policy process is conceptualized. There are many examples of this. This is just two examples. Is we're not adopting any of this. This is just to show that the thinking is we'll go from the cycle and go like that and then come back in one. However, as we will show later in some of our work, some of our work involves four of these are together at the same time happening as opposed to going. And then some of that time we're actually starting from implementation and going back to formulation. So how do we how do we do that? So because to address some of the challenges, this approach has not worked effectively. So this will come up a lot in the introduction. You heard that we've had a master class on this. We we'll talked about social technical systems a lot. It's called foundation to the theory that we use. This is just an example. We've had a master class full on this one. So it will be online. If it's not online, it will be online shortly. But please listen to it. This picture alone had a full master class on it. So it's Dense, it's important, it's very useful. It's about the core of the theory that, that guides our work. But what it means is that technologies have social components and technical components, and they need to come together in the work. So we look at that very strongly. We will revisit it because this, some of the elements I won't discuss it now, but you see the five core dimensions that shape the social technical and approach and system. This is using mobility, but there could be social technical system for food systems for energy for different areas. So this is just an example of if you're looking at mobility, what would you say as the components of the social technical system? Imagine that regulations could be a big area on its own and each of these are big independent areas themselves. So how do you move change across the small levels? Take it, taking into consideration the social but also the the technological components. So in summary of the why, this is some of the reasons why we do why we do what we're doing and the approach we take and the driver of what we're doing. SDGs, as we started with, the need for transformation and the way we've seen transformation, we don't think the traditional approach will actually address the SDG. It will require a lot of radical thinking, it require deep systems change. So there's a, there's a there's a sister project we have called Deep Transitions, working on that as well. So that's one of the reasons. The world agrees now that we need to move towards a sustainability, a sustainability transition, move, transition towards a more sustainable future. So that is also the important of redirecting R&D and science, technology, and innovation towards a more sustainable uh, areas as well. And then policy, importance of strength in policy making. Social technical system change is required. Then uh, we'll talk about some of these words later, nations and regimes who come across them. The idea here being for this kind of change we're talking about to happen, there's need for understanding the landscape issues, the landscape pressure, the rules that govern what we do and the better rules. So this also informs some of the capabilities we've been building in our work. Uh, the, again, there is need for narratives to be changed, but partnerships are required. Capability directionality I mentioned, and that goes back. So it doesn't look like I'm doing well on my time, so let's move a bit faster. So how does TIPSI view these capabilities? What do we do again? Like I said, we'll be discussing what we do, and then from there, we'll be seeing the capabilities we build. And two, we want, this is a conceptual framework that emerged from the discussion we have been having already, redirecting r and innovation to economic growth has been frame one and frame two, I mean, using it directly that way. But the question, what we've been looking at, how do we use research and innovation to inform environmental societal challenges, grand challenges, big society challenges, and in the process, we also achieve this and achieve that. So that is one way to look at it. So as opposed to thinking that by doing research and development, innovation must come up, and then we have economic growth, which is great. But how do we take care of this. So this is a conceptual framework, and this framework is informed by this theory behind the which I did mention that there has been a full masterclass on that. You can see the five dimensions here. We'll look at them later again. Science and technology, culture, technology, policy, industry. These are the five dimensions that need to move across. So again, please, there's a full masterclass on this, so I'm not going to try to go into this. It's a whole 45 minutes on its own. So. <laughs> 
it, but, but that's just to show that what we're doing, our conceptual framework is informed by very strong theory that is globally being accepted and then it works very well. So this is that, and that also informs the capacity we've been, we've been building. So, so one of the first things we do for members when they join in Tipsy, what we do is to map the ecosystem using the frame three approach. So they do ecosystem mapping, South Africa did it, the countries did it, and then they map their system, applying the frame three thinking. So they look at different things. So we had four countries uh, uh, involved in the HGCI, South Africa, Ghana has done it, Kenya has done it, Latin America, we've done it with Colombia, we've also done it with Mexico, we've done it with in, in the European hub, or the Nordic hub, we have Sweden, we have Norway. The Africa findings from that is documented in the entire output from this mapping and the pilots is documented in this book, which is uh, from South Africa, yeah, yeah, from colleagues from NACI. And then we have a chapter in that, but also the African work is also being captured here. So why do we do this? We'll see later what kind of capability we build in the process of doing this. So this again, informed by the theory I've just described as usual. So why do we make control? Why do we work with the member countries to do this? Because it helps to First position, get their vocabulary right, begin to change, they develop them, they see the concept, they also begin to see what in their NSI, what in, the, in their systems are towards frame one, towards frame two, towards frame three. So they'll be able to locate where, where, the, where the work is. So another thing we've done is to work with different partners to do this. If we want to do SDG, we want to do transformation, and we want to achieve the kind of system change. Virtually, this is a research project. So, uh, uh, so we also then work with different countries, different actors to develop a research agenda. So, because the idea being, we can continue in the way we're doing research before and hope to change to happen. So this was a work, some colleagues in this room were in part of that meeting. We had, we had some questions, guiding questions. In the next slide, you'll see a bit more of, of what happened. So there is a research, Agenda not on STI policy, but on okay, tip research agenda on STI policy. How we looked at okay, if we want to make this kind of change, if we want to do transformative innovation, what role should research be played? And what kind of research? How should we carry that kind of research? Now it wasn't just tips you come together and write up a research agenda. You see in the next slide that they involved a very strong collaboration process, which we refer to as co-creation. So co-creation in our field is not very common. We don't have the networks normally working together, but what we've been doing is uh, we have global leagues, we have African leagues, we have different meetings. This meeting, uh, we organized this one in 2018, and then there's another one, there's another one to develop this research agenda required a lot of collaboration, which has not been the way this kind of work is done. Normally you have, a network develop their research agenda and goes through the board. The idea being, if we all want to achieve SDG, achieve transformation, how do we pull resources, pull knowledge, work together to get this? And that involved developing a research agenda that we cannot stand behind it and work. So it came up with this. This is online, you can look at it, but there's many, many sets of meetings and networks involving four or five networks. Uh, the, STRN the network, IST conference, I didn't mention IST, but EU SPRI is the European Science Policy Research and Innovation Group. I always forget the EU SPRI. So the Global X is here, but we also have TIPS here as well, part of it. And then what else do we do again? How do we work again? I've just mentioned some of these. These are some of the networks, as you can see, we're working. Deep Transitions is looking at the same topic. EU SPRI is looking at the same topic. STRN is Sustainability Transitions Network. We're also looking at that. Uh, we've done a big project with Climate Kick, is a European Union funded project where they're also looking at issues like this. So, but how do we work with this? So, in our thinking, why do we work in networks? Why don't we just do it ourselves? So, there is some capability building implication in taking that approach again to, to developing that. Why is partnerships important in this kind of work? Because the kind of transformation we seek is not one research institute or one country being able to develop the kind of work output we expect. So there's a lot of networks and partnerships involved in the work we're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. one, one thing I didn't mention in the beginning, if you see the bottom there, there's TIPC. This team is they are based in Spain and they do a lot of our evaluation components, whereas we have partners in other parts as well. So, so this requires a lot of partnership work happening. 
from the capabilities and the work we've been doing, one of the most difficult area we have seen is we have experienced is this part co-creation, which is important. It leads to inclusivity, but it also leads to co-creation. How do you bring people with different ideas, with different concepts to work together in this to move the agenda forward, the agenda for transformation? So we did a policy experiment with our colleagues here in South Africa, and uh, this came out, but also the previous slide, you can see how we're trying to make it. It's, it sounds easy, but it's not very easy in, in, uh, in operation. So because there is different tension in, the, in working in the cooperation space. So we've been doing that between policymakers and academics. We also entered into different spaces where we have academics trying to understand and speak the language of policymakers and vice versa. So many of the policymakers we work with are actually very good researchers now because they have been us sent research agenda, they have been us in evaluation, they have been us in the component of action research, you know, similar you know, in a way, making our research more action research because it's providing feedback as we're doing the research. So we have what we call EPEs, experimental policy engagements, where we engage different actors, policy makers. We've developed what we call a transformative outcomes that also involve a lot of uh, work, cooperation. So in a nutshell, this is very, very important area of work. And you can see the learning events and learning journey where it is involved. So co-creation being one of the strongest capability area of the building, helping people to open up. So tipsy material, tipsy outputs are open access also for the same reason. So how do you do that? At what level should it be open access? Should everything be open access? So it's not an easy place, but this is a, that's why it was a building. So we have something also called one of the areas of our work is uh, transformative outcomes. And putting it, uh, uh, putting it simply, system change, as we know, as we've been discussing, trying to change many systems together at the same time. And it's not easy. It takes, it requires complex interaction from different animals. So we have niches here, niches, regime or landscape, which we explained again. I'll talk a little bit about it now, just for those who don't know. But then there's changes in rules, which I talked about. The multi actor, this need to be negotiated, contested spaces. Change is not just confined sometimes in one space or one place. And you have many actors working together. So, if we able to achieve this and know that transformation is actually happening, that we're moving towards a sustainable future that we like, how do we know that? How do we measure that? How do we evaluate that? How do we assess that? So, some of those questions led us into what we call transformative outcomes. How do you know that the system is transforming towards expected or desired future or desired outcome? How do we know? So again, working with this principle, again, the theoretical framework that guides this work, not the same law we have, but as a well that we put into this stuff. Okay, but working with this, we developed these three areas of transformative outcomes, which on part for that, they become 12, but we will not go into that because there's been a master class on this as well. So please, uh, one of our colleagues has given a very good masterclass on this, how I'm discussing all of them one by one. But the, the important thing is we use them to be able to know how the system could be transforming or be able to check or the outcomes to check the outcomes we want so we could measure against these outcomes. And then when you come to capability part of it, what are we, what do we do in, in terms of the why develop this? transformative outcomes. How do we use them? What capability do we build with the people we work with as they do, as they engage with us on this? So we'll come to those ones as well, just a, a summary. You can see a set of four sub-processes. So each of them building and nurturing niches will have some under that. We'll see some of them going. Uh, expanding and mainstreaming niches. Okay, niches being here, some of these smaller actors who According to this theory, if they get strong enough and work together, can go up and change something here. However, this change here would also, may also be influenced. We need something happening on the landscape. So the SDGs, for example, is a landscape pressure. Uh, some people think of it also more. So how does the landscape pressure here happening have to destabilize something here so that these actors can come together and group and then create a new desirable future? So this is the thinking. So 
how do we know that is how do we view these nations? That's for example. So the first transformative outcome is say, how do you view? How do you if there are some that exist, how do you nurture them to grow? How do you protect them? So we have different ways of looking at that. So the theory is quite very strong as well. How do you expand them? How do you and how do you help this place to open up, create spaces here so that the dominant actors um, are not able to suck these guys in in the two months? How do we open up the regime actors? So, and then how can we take advantage of landscape pressures when they happen to be able to make this happen? So there is, a, again, just a few slides we want to show how we compact this. It's quite detailed work that happens on this, and we work with countries for weeks, sometimes months. We can see the configurations. But like I said, there's been a master class on this, so we can also share the link if you don't have if you don't have it or you need it. And it's very interesting, very interesting piece of work. We can have the formation, how the old one begins to break down for the new one to emerge. But some some of these places here could be very unstable. So how do you deal with that? But the details on that, again, this is a similar thing, learning different transformative outcomes, navigating expectations, shielding, some of the work we do for some of the Spaces that policymakers provide for us is around shielding so that we can protect some spaces for us to work with some actors. So we can go into the details for that. Okay, so so theory of change. There has been many theory of change before we've worked there. So one of the experiments we did was to develop a theory of change with uh, actors we work with and build that capability on that. We did a we did a living thing. The policy experiment with the living catchment here is in South Africa is a team with the Sandy and the Water Research Commission. These are some of the outcomes here. It's maybe not very easy for you to read, but what you can see here is how we apply. These are outputs, but how we apply the theory, the theory we've been talking about, building and navigating niches and expanding niches. This is a very important work we did with them. It's a different approach to the theory of change that we have before, which is as you come up with it. This theory of change focuses on long-term changes, but also transformation. Supposed to develop, you get the project, you develop it, you finish it, and then the outputs come, you report it, this is job done, no, but how do we check? So some of the tools we also use. We tried it as much as possible to expand this, but it didn't work out. The actual materials are here and it's also available. So this is a this is an infographic to show. Uh, it's still relevant because this was around water, water management projects and then looking at catchment. So there's biodiversity, there's a, a there's water, there's SDG components, and even difficult to read here, yeah, but this is a, an example. This is one of the examples of a theory of change that we did with the project with, uh, with Unova Sweden. And as you look at this, you can see capacity building spread across the project. Different cases, look at different cases, months and weeks of work. So the kind of theory of change developed is different again from the from the from the from the regular one. Climate cake, which is why it was in the slide before. And developing the tools, testing the tool feedback, workbook, capacity building. So explaining that this is how we build our capability, working with actors and developing this work. There's a few more, one or two of them. I've talked about the importance of evaluation. How do we know that the system is changing and transforming and towards the desired outcome or desired future that we want? Again, if you look at the SDG as a landscape, it's setting the context on the landscape where most people now accept that transformation is important. We need to move towards a desirable, more desirable future that is less destructive on the environment, less inequality, and that happen. How do we take advantage? So this again shows how this may be happening. Some of the regime elements that need to be looked at and how we may be able to do that. So we have, and you can see what is happening here. How do you look at one nation or two nations, multiple nations combined, then they can become strong to be put together as a plan and income and have outcomes and impact that we desire. So policy experiment, we just to explain that I've talked about all these experiments with few, but look at the the way we we do somewhat the result. These are some of the examples that we've done. Uh, looking at the case from from Vinova, I've just mentioned that. Also the case from South Africa, we mentioned that and the climate kit we didn't mention the we will talk about that, but the idea being from all our members, this is what we do, working with them on each of them. So we also not, 
working as this is a finished theory of finished but they're also learning the process and the theory is involved so at the end there's a lot of capacity building happening because the narratives the context the language the way they design experiment the way they design programs are beginning to change you can see that direct impact on some of the work our colleagues are doing in colombia there's a there's a great paper developed by the ministry a great book developed on transformation based on the work we've been doing there. So we see the impact and how the and how they've been working. So after mentioning policy experiment for a while, what do we actually do in the policy experiment? This is one one methodology, the one we use for South Africa is around this one. It's intense, it takes a takes a couple of weeks. So it's quite it's quite a, a tough one from our experience. But you can see the first thing about set interactions where work with them in the interior of change module is the first part and then we look at the connecting the theory of change to the transformative outcomes this is the change i want to achieve how do you connect it to the outcomes how do you use the transformative outcome as a lens to then look at that and make the connection and then lastly how do you measure that the change is happening so there is a lot of capacity building around evaluation so the, I'll talk a little bit about evaluation. So this is a very important part because it's easy to say everything is happening, everything is great, we're getting all the outcome. It's easy to tick the boxes and go away, but no, that's not what we want to do. We want to really measure the change and learn from the change and move and see how the change is happening and be able to see that the, 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 the new practices, the new theories, the new routines that, we, that we're trying to inculcate into the system is actually being institutionalized. So how do you capture those? So without going into the details, you can see their interactions, the remains with them, and then they have a break to do preparatory work, we define the theory of change, we go back, and then this. So this took about, what was it, 14 weeks? Yeah, about 14 weeks for this, we did, we did, we did to complete this one. So that is that that is in a way to look at. So the evaluation we're talking about here is formative evaluations. It's slightly different as well from evaluation for accountability, which is a summative evaluation, which is different from the one we do. So we look at how do you keep doing, changing, evaluating yourself and changing in the process. So it could be so. You look at that. It takes a strategic dimension. So it's not just the project is finished. I account to the I evaluate the project and tell you that all the money has been well spent. That is slightly different from what we do here. We can we can do it at program level, at policy level, but also at a, a process level, at a project level. It's informed by our tipsy principles, the ones I showed before, with directionality, second order learning, participation, and then the, the building blocks, which is the foundations, really are based on this thinking that we're looking at sustainability transition, system change, transformative innovation. Intervention participants are also the one analyzing themselves. So there's a lot of reflexivity here, which is one of the strongest capabilities we do because you have to stop and think and follow a different approach. Again, we also have to measure this. And so reflexivity and learning process addresses failure of analysis, which doesn't happen sometimes. We finish project we want to go. It involves mixed method approach. There's qualitative, there's quantitative. And then eventually we also integrated it with the policy processes involved, with formulation, with implementation, looking at the governance structure that actually can enable that. And then it requires development of uh, internal capacity. So another way that we do capabilities, I'm still on the how. Sorry, guys, it's a bit long. <laughs> I'm still on the how, but we're nearing the end. So the, we also have conferences where we present the work, where we learn from each other. Where there is a lot of discussion happening so the conferences help us to do that uh, there's been many of them i've just listed a few here and uh, the last one was 2022 why is it important because we also bring in the knowledge we're learning learning is at the core of what we do on this so we bring in the knowledge people are presenting uh, sweden uh, was important spain is not here uh, and one more went to spare, I remember 2019 or so we there. So very important point. So, so this is one way, we won't talk much about that. South Africa, for example, in 2022, should be organized a learning event where we also learn from the work they're doing. So it's a global, not learning from global south and vice versa. And they're very, very, very quickly as well. We're building a lot of capabilities through 
setting up community of practice. If you remember in the beginning, we talked about talked about the need for demonstrators. So if we actually have people who can do this, how do you do them? How do you scale it up? So by bringing people into communities of practice, it's important because of the capabilities we're building there. We have community tipsy as a global level of community of practice, but we also have a regional level. We have a, we have regional level. Uh, uh, we have the Africa one involving four countries as we speak now. Latin America, as I mentioned before, and then in another country. And then we have a, we also have that network level. So we also have Global XCA, EU Spree, and many of these groups are beginning to talk the language of TIP, the Transformative Innovation Policy. There was a very important meeting last week or so, or less than two, at the UN level with Global X, with uh, TIPC, and many of the big actors at the UN, uh, UN General Assembly recently discussing this issue. How do we use this for SDG? So, this is important to build this community of practice because, in a way, the form has, the theory we're talking about has, has some niches, which at some point we hope they can come together and really try to change for, for transformation we're looking at. One, of, one area of innovation, which is always a problem, is funding and finance, which is uh, always an issue. So what are we doing on that? You can see this is a mix of policymakers and private sector finance. Our own dad is here, so some of you recognize him. And then, so we're also looking at many policies don't get implemented because finance. One of the reasons climate change is struggling, there's predictions, we need one trillion, one this. There's still a lot of finance required to get us to the directions we're going, but we're still seeing some resistance in that area. So this is a, a group of part of our deep transitions project, the sister project I mentioned, where we're bringing global funders together, investment to look at how do you change your investment philosophy so that it actually drives towards transformation and transformative innovation. So we have Kenya, we have many countries here. These are some of them are quite uh, very influential people talking in the field. So there is a much serious work going here. But what one of the output coming out? So you can tell from here that many of these people don't already fund this kind of work. We're saying. So how do we build their capability to be able to fund transformation? To be because it's different. There is a there is a challenge of uh, we need to get results now. We need to get you know return on investment. But this kind of funding may not be that may not be the focus. It may also not just be with funding for social care, no. So, so there's a different philosophy that we're building here among this uh, category, among this team on how. It's a lot of work has gone into this, many meetings, several meetings. I think the, the, the investment philosophy will be out soon, if not this month, maybe next month, and it'll be again public. We can read really how this group of people are working to change the investment philosophy. So massive capabilities and, and for financing, transformative innovation there. So at, at lastly, we have this one, uh, missions, which we won't talk much about, transformative missions. We're working on missions. There's been a lot of work done between uh, transformative innovation policy and missions. And then how do we do transformative missions? So we're working on that as well. So the traditional thinking on missions would be you achieve a massive project. But we can do that. We can also do that, like taking man to the moon is the commonest example we give. But there are many other missions. The EU has six areas of missions, health being some of one of them, cancer being another. So many countries already have missions project. But what we're saying here is you can do missions, achieve a massive technological feat without addressing social problems, without addressing uh, environmental problems. In some cases, it might even exacerbate them and make them worse. So, so we've been working around that. And uh, so in, in summary, in conclusion, this is the capabilities we've been building and that's to show you how we build them. So by working with NSI system actors mapping, we've been building capabilities around the tip vocabulary. This is a very important area because you begin to use the language properly, they begin to understand so what is transformation in this sense. And then we're also building capability about the key concepts. What are the theories to inform this kind of work? It's not just saying what to achieve SDG and we tick boxes that everything, you know, it will easily go into box ticking work. So, but how really do we achieve deep system change? And what are the concepts around that can help shape that? So each of those, how I would describe, have many capabilities loaded in the work we do with them. Uh, many of them also not informed about the theories and frameworks that inform this kind of work. 
what theories, I mean, MLP, the one we use, multi-level perspective, but it's really, if you don't really use that, but what it means is deep system change, long-term change that can transform a society. So ideas and narratives, we want them to change as well. One, some of the ideas being, we just fund research and we expect innovation and we expect economic growth to happen and it doesn't happen. So how do we change those kind of ideas? They've been able to build their capabilities on how to select cases, case studies which, with the uh, transformative potential, with the potentials to be able to, so we can direct research on that, direct research on this case. We talked about reflexive learning. I didn't explain what we mean by second order learning, but it's a different kind of learning where we also begin to question yourself. So we've been doing policy making, as I explained, in a very linear fashion. We finish formulation, we give it to some people to implement. But second learning will be, we need to actually stop and question, why are we doing it like this? We have to create the why. Why shouldn't we be doing it differently? How else could we be doing this? So those happen. And developing the team research agenda, you can see the set of capabilities for the building. Again, I'm saying I'm using them in continuous sense because we're still working on many of this. So they've not finished. Uh, agenda setting, assessing alternatives, co-creation, which is very important. Transdisciplinarity, which is not very popular in many places, is growing now, but it's what importance of networks and knowing that you, one of us only can achieve this change. You know? uh, and transformative outcomes to be building capabilities around policy analysis. How do we evaluate our own policies? Implementation, evaluation, impact, impact level. So this is all here as a summary. So the, the, the top shows how we do it, then the bottom is the kind of explaining the kind of capabilities we've been building in the process of doing what we do, which is again informed by very strong theory. So EP is a policy experiment, uh, the experimental policy engagement. What are we doing that? Why do we do that? What do we achieve by doing that? Again, selection of uh, uh, experiment is important. So we just don't select the same kind of result, the same kind of research or experiment that will not lead to transformation in our way. So implementation, well, we doing a lot of work around governance, different. The South African work was around water management. Again, how do you govern water differently in South Africa so that issues of uh, we have before are different. So that is what Sambia has been focusing on. How do we include the catchment area, the local heads, the chiefs, the other community of practice, the informal actors, how do we include that? So those issues lead to governance, rethinking governance structure, transformative outcomes, I think I'll mention that. So, oh, did I go back before? Okay, so this one is a community of practices. Again, we do a lot of learning in that, in those spaces. Uh, it is transformative investment and missions is the last one. So what capabilities have we built? You have seen the list before, so the question has been answered. The last slide there is just to show that the capabilities we've been building, they form into this group of uh, categories. So a lot of them deal with research, operation, research, kind of research we do, selection, we also have some on policy and then others on evaluation, transformative outcomes, why is important, what kind of theory of change do we need to be set? to do that. So it is being informed by a lot of the questions we ask. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on knowledge management by building a knowledge infrastructure of where who are the people working on transformation and transformation. Those networks mentioned in the beginning, they're all here, and then governance and then the funding. So conclusion, the last one, this work, where is it heading us to? We're looking at a shared future, you know, developing virtual learning and anticipation of, of heading forward. It's a long way where we're getting to go. The kind of system change we're talking takes a while. And uh, we're also moving from, uh, we need to move a bit more from formulation, formulation into implementation a lot more. So this work focuses more on that direction of move from implementation. How do we change evaluation so that we're evaluating for transformation, not just evaluating for accountability, which is a traditional thing to do? I've talked about transformative missions and investment, and then the importance of innovation in the way we, we govern policies. That's a good time. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody still hear us? Uh, 
Amanda Lawrence, yes. Okay, we're still connected. This is great. Sorry, we're still having, we've now just had low shedding starts. Um, and, and so hopefully we'll, we'll keep going uh, without interruption. Um, you'll see as well that uh, Chucks is on one screen and, uh, and I'm on another screen, again, uh, due to the, uh, the slight uh, technical issues that we've, we've had today. We've had to move rooms um, and, and so the, the IT setup isn't quite as we, we would like. Um, however, that being said, uh, thank you Chucks for a very uh, illuminating and, and useful uh, masterclass. Um, I, uh, it was great to have your, your three or four summary slides. Um, I've been putting together my, my own summary. Um, so I think uh, my takeaways with regards to your, your masterclass are about doing policy differently. Um, starting with uh, the idea that policy capabilities uh, needs, it isn't just about building capabilities or um, or, or uh, supporting policymakers per se, but about networks of, uh, of stakeholders and actors within the policy process and that, uh, and that real co-creation uh, co and, and co-learning uh, process that's required for, for effective uh, policy. Um, the, the second thing that I, I took away was this um, issue of, of not not thinking about policy capabilities particularly, which was uh, the, the first two words in your, in your title um, uh, of this masterclass, but transformative innovation policy capabilities, which are subtly different. And so it's about thinking differently about system change, about transformation and making transformation the, the starting point for policy discussions. Um, this, this idea of changing the way we do policy at a program level in particular. So um, thinking about experimentation to institutionalize niche projects um, in, uh, in a way that perhaps doesn't always happen. Um, and I, I was quite taken with this, the, the MEL element, the monitoring, evaluation and learning element uh, for program policy change. And, and reflexivity and the ability of looking at and using monitoring, evaluation, learning and doing it differently in order to close the, the policy process cycle uh, that you showed at the, at the beginning. Um, so really useful. So thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions. I've seen people around the room writing down lots of, lots of notes and hopefully questions as well. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So if you are online and would like to ask Chucks a question or a clarification, please do put your hand up. Um, you should see the reaction button at the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you click on that, you should be able to, to put your hand up or just put your camera on and, and wave at me and I'll, I'll hopefully see you and, and, and we'll be able to ask you to join the conversation. Um, while we wait for some reactions from those online, um, would somebody in the audience like to kick us off? No, the idea is not that agencies don't do that because we didn't invent formative evaluation since we have been. The point is we this is what we use for tips and work. This is what we prefer to yes. use, as opposed to evaluation for accountability. Yes. Summative evaluation. So this is better because he has learning. Now we yeah, this approach is better for tips and kind of work because it's to be iterated, he has learning, and you can actually correct things yes. as is happening, as opposed to wait at the end of the project and then you do that and then you accountability. So there are the difference there. But also another difference in the general work we do is this aspect of demonstration as well. Yeah. So what we hear a lot is a complaint around policy not working, policy implementation not happening, or it's very low, or the rate of implementation is very low. So the question is, what approach is there to change this? So one of the way we're doing it is then to think differently about it and try different experiments, demonstrate ways that be different and then if that works then we can use that to inform a new way of formulation as opposed to continue to say this is not working implementation is very low and so this is where the experiments come in so how we then select the experiment 
how we then, of course, we do have experiment we have to evaluate it as ourselves. We can't say the tipsy approach is great and then we don't know whether it's working or not. So that's also why we adopted the formative evaluation plan and then the formative evaluation approach because the, the way Mel is done yeah. uh, is that it, and, and theory of change is done is that the, the conceptualization of outcomes is fundamentally different from the way outcomes are considered in relation to routine theory of change mm -hmm. thinking. Um, it's uh, it, it's quite, I don't want to use the word formulate, but I can't think of another word to use, but there is a particular way of thinking about outcomes and it's about those outcomes moving a what works mm -hmm. uh, and scaling it up. And, and simply regime change as a result of, of that. So I didn't, we didn't go into details about the governance, but this is the area of uh, governance. So a lot of the governance issues around people talk about coordination. Again, the question is, how do we do an experiment that actually shows a different way to set up not just top down or bottom up, but a different approach of governance that is also based on the team principles of inclusion. So one, one of the focus of this approach is on grassroots innovation actors who are most often excluded. The question is why they're excluded. So this is one area of a governance. But another area is on the policy align where our policy changes. Now, again, part of the problem having done you know, the policy is People looking at focusing on the policy itself a lot. So let's just have more policy, let's just have more policy. If we step back a little bit, which is where second order learning come in, is it the policy we need or the change that we really need? So if it's the system change that we're looking at or the transformation, what are the routes to this transformation? It was I we're having a discussion and then I was saying, okay, do we need do we need a solar or we need energy? So if you're asking the question is how do I transport myself or how do I move? That is a different question. So when we're setting the research agenda, you can see why these questions are important, the way we also frame the question. So there's a lot of focus in many places on policy as policy, which is great. I did it oops, spend many years on that, but many of the times it's not policy to address some of these issues. So we end up with so many policies, many of them have been updated, but the plaster hammering on policy. Ultimately, what do we need to change? Maybe we need to target inequality or we need to target unemployment. So what do we need to address unemployment? How do we redirect around the STI to inequality, to water problem, to this? So those are some of the questions. However, to answer this one is around the governance issues of the question. How you really do you govern the ecosystem and our policies and policy making, which we're hoping again. If Ghana can join, we can go nicely to a policy experiment on that to look at different configuration, different approach to actually do policy governance as opposed to long term. So yeah, we don't have a prescriptive a prescription that this is the way to do it. We again follow the theory and try to look at who are the actors working on the governance space and the policy space. How do we include the ones that are excluded? What governance arrangement will allow that? If you also assemble the policies in a country, what are they all trying to do? What are they all trying to say? How do we not focus on term policies but we focus on the challenges that are facing the country or the region? So, <laughs> Rob, do you want to add to that? Point well taken around um, the need to to move things uh, potentially beyond policy and and into the action action field. Thank you. A very good question. What what we started? If you not, we started with the pilots. So that is which is okay. We were on one phase, and in the global north, it's a little bit different. So countries like Sweden and Finland, they've already doing things around systems of innovation before, which is a bit of that. But in the global side, it's even more difficult. But even though those were happening, we still needed to have a level playing field to understand. With them. So, one of the first things, which is why this also started with it. So, the presentation actually is an evolution of the way we'll be going. So, the first idea of letting them do the pilot, some people, the idea was we do the pilot with you and then you decide whether you join or not. So, it really helps them to see the value of this, whether it's useful, whether it's relevant. And then we, we developed a, a vocabulary page where they, we kind of define 
each of the types. So what is system of innovation, what is this, what is that explain what do we mean? Because many of these people we're working with don't speak this language at all. But now we've seen the evolution just using South Africa case from that point in five, six years to where they're now selecting experiment. They're experts, they're actually ahead of us in some of the things going on now. So as we're talking in the, in the, in the, the bad part of the evaluation, we develop transformative outcomes with them, and then they use the transformative outcomes then to develop indicators, which they then use to check against their theory of change. So it's a whole process of going on, but these are not things they were doing before. Before we actually started the experiment, they had a theory of change, which we had to work with them to say, okay, this is a theory of change, but the kind of vision you have, this may not get to them, for example, or this kind of, the kind of system level, long-term deep transformation you want, because they want to, it's a massive bold objective, you know. So we see how this has happened, both with the policy makers, but also the researchers. We're talking about funders now, who are experts in finance. No doubt, they are, some of them manage funds, have billions in them, but they don't do this aspect. So you see how by the meeting, the interaction, we also begin to say, okay, how do you redirect some of your funds into this area? But I that requires I I I I them. So yeah, we see for many of our partners, we see how from the basics of understanding the tipsy concept, the theory, the, and then to be able to select the experiment, which is say building their capability, okay, what is the potential project or program or policy we can take forward as an experiment and then work more on it. And so we see all those change happening until the point they begin to do evaluation. So we're looking in the next one, which is the conclusion slide. There's a lot we see in the future. How do you actually then anticipate and different connections, different angles that we are applying this kind of thinking to? So we're also open. Tipsy also to is an experiment. So so we're also learning and also seeing how this will go forward. But the point being, really, the kind of change we're still looking forward to, we're not close to it globally at all, because we know climate change is still going on, a lot of fossil fuel dependence, we still have many of these problems, traffic in our big cities, so how do we still solve it? So this is, those are the directions. So we will see the capabilities also getting bigger and stronger, and alongside the complexities of the challenges we have to face. So it would be maybe having multiple experiments, you know, different way and learning from them, connecting. So we just started our own capabilities also growing by building a research infrastructure to begin to collect the amount of data coming from all the experiments. So that also will be an evolution for us, not just the five experiments, but maybe 20, 30, and the things happening. So yeah, but in math is a you know, major area of our, of our work now. So how do we actually now begin to monitor these changes? And, check that transformation is happening in the direction. So using our transformative outcomes, which is again, is ours, we're not saying it's the only one that's the best, but that's what we've developed. And then we also, we're talking this morning that maybe this methodology might change, don't you really also change? As we get more knowledge, new framework may come out and replace us. So those are the conditions we're expecting to have, because there's a lot of rich lessons now and then from the research data coming up. So we don't see this, happening forever because it's not perfect itself. So <laughs> theory of the framework, none will be perfect. And all of them will have to evolve as well and go forward. Hopefully that helps on the evolution question. Yeah. Okay, we can add the who and we can add the when and we can add the <laughs> others. Anyway, the, the way Tipsy is structured is a, a team of researchers and policy makers. Style. So those are the who and policymakers at individual level, of course. So we have some of them hopefully in the meeting as well. So those are the two key starting elements and individuals, of course. But these policymakers are based in institutions. So we're based in uh, universities, but they're based in the DSI here. They're based in the Vinova. We have actors there. So there's a lot of individuals. So many of the capabilities, which we didn't go into breaking them down, which one is institutional, individual, organizational, which one is technological capabilities, dynamic can be we can go into all that. But ultimately we work with individuals, which then do two things. They develop their own capabilities or skills individual scales, which is one, but then they also have the potential to transform the institution. So some of the capabilities we do as institutional, 
So some of the transformative outcomes, which we didn't go into, you could see here, it was institutionalizing what we're doing, changing the rules, changing the routines. We won't have an institution select a policy experiment. So we're building the capability of individuals, as you said, and in able to design experiment, select an experiment, uh, to do a case study, use the team thinking or approach to analyze policy making. So those are what individuals do with us. So the experiment we have was about 10, 15 people every time, but then we had uh, some observers and different, but the core group was about 15 of us, three or four from our side, yeah, and about seven or eight from Sandy, the other one from so who we're working with in this thinking. So ultimately it comes out to individual capabilities we're building because we have not gone to many institutions and say, let's do this. But the experiment will have no way fail us. Look at how they can restructure their programs with the deep thinking. So we've done some work on that in Sweden and Finland in Nordic area. There's also looking at institutional reconfiguration. We're having a discussion where it would be nice to do some experiment on our funders. So some of our main partners are funding agencies. Looking at, so these are the range of stakeholders. But primarily in the presentation, if you look at it, you see researchers and policymakers from there. So we have researchers working with policymakers. And then you saw funders at the last part, but also ultimately, these are the two levels, it's individual and institutional capabilities we're building. So which we can go down and break them down. And, uh, individual, this is least, or institutional, these are the least. But changing routines, changing the way policy is done is will be happening at the institutional level. However, you will still require individuals to be able to implement that, to do that. Everything we do on this <laughs> systems level, so it's implied already that you know, this is all systems of innovation based approach. Even the social technical approach here yeah, is a change up there. Systems level, systems change. The second slide, the why we do this is, is very clear that, that this is about systems level of change, right? We're talking about. So, why? What is the point of doing this one? Well, we explain the summary again. We got the sustainability and this a uh, social technical systems change. So, we are already operating at the assistant level, yeah, but really to look at the stakeholders here, yeah, it would have been a lot clearer on that, but policymakers and researchers. So we didn't mention yet yeah, that we're building a lot of research capabilities it's because the title has been on policy capability, but there's a lot of research capabilities we're building from. Research agenda for transformation, how do we say that, do we choose that? Plus the risk, the, some of us have been working on transformation a lot. Some people have been working on the theories, but even the researchers working on it have all capabilities being is evolving as a label asked. We're also learning and implying that the, the keyword you use now. So a lot of learning and is one of our main criteria. So how do we also learn from the system and see what is working? We talked about the theoretical framework itself evolving, is learning that is informing the kind of things we see where the theoretical framework might evolve towards how we might expand and move forward. So, that's so, it. Okay. Um, I think we should draw it to a close. Uh, I'm sure we will keep discussing though, uh, but I, I do think we probably have to bring it formally to a close. So, thanks everybody online for staying with us. Uh, apologies again for the technical issues. Um, the recording will be made available uh, in due course on our YouTube channel. Um, and thank you to everybody in the room for participating. And thank you, uh, Chucks, for uh, a wonderful masterclass. Um, <laughs>